honor, Lord God. We give you glory today, Lord God. You are high and lifted up, Lord God. There is none like you, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you, Lord God, that though people have searched high and low, Lord God, no one can find a God like you. Father, we give glory to you this morning, Lord God, for all that you are yet to do. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, for where we've come from, Lord God. And we thank you for where we're going. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your will. And I thank you for your way. Father, anoint the ground of my heart. Father, anoint this word as seed. Father, anoint the sower. Hide her in the gift that you've given to your body so that we will receive a life-changing, destiny-accelerating revelation of you through your word, by your spirit, under your anointing. We pray expecting in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God a great big shout of praise. But I just praise God and thank God for all of you who did come out um, despite the weather and the time change. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, today is, is special in so many ways and I'm excited for the word to go forth today and to share so many things and even hear testimonies of what God has done uh, in your lives. But I want to say that today marks two years for the memorial service that we have for Bishop Ben. Today marks two years. And so um, let's just give God a great big hand clap of praise for the transition, amen, and what Bishop meant in your life, what he meant in your life, what he did in your life, and the assignment that God had for him here, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We just thank God and praise God because we're not those who grieve. But we can remember and reflect what God left us, the assignment that took place, and our part in that assignment, and all that we learned and all that we received and all that we walked in and continue to walk in. Amen. We thank God and we celebrated two years ago the life, the legacy, and the leadership. And we will continue to celebrate the life, the legacy, and the leadership. Amen. And so though we may not talk about it every single year and commemorate every single year, it is something that is in the foundation of this ministry. Amen. It's in the foundation of this ministry and the assignment and the anointing that was given to us and is continuing with me and the family and the, and the staff and, and many of you that are servant leaders will continue into the future, amen? amen. So again, I just give God glory. I give him, uh, just give him glory and honor for that, amen? We don't have to be sad. No, no. We don't have to be sad. And while there are those that are still in a place of, uh, of dear mourning, I think that's because maybe they didn't live right. Maybe they didn't do some things right. Maybe they ignored the word and the wisdom that went forth. And so now there's a regret. There's a regret. But there's no regret here. There's no regret here because I believe that those of you who are here, you made it here because you listened. You listened. You listened to the word that said forward. Yeah, you listened to the word that said forward. That word that said forward that was given at the end of 2016 for 2017. You listened to the word that said forward. And so you didn't allow yourself to get stuck in man's tradition and stuck in man's ways and stuck in flesh and stuck in what people wanted. But you allowed yourself to move forward in the things of God, which was what our leader instructed us to do. And so I just thank God and praise God. Y'all are more special than you even know because you determined that you were going to listen to the Holy Spirit and not the traditions of men. And so again, I just thank God for you all so much and I appreciate you so much. I'm excited to see and to know where God is taking us, where our future is together. Amen. 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 Well, you know, we are, uh, we are 295 days left. 295 days left in this year. Now, I know that's not that far from 365, but we still have 295 days left for the Lord God to do the supernatural in your life. And so while we're believing God for overflow, we know that he's going to bring about and manifest that overflow in our lives. I want you to just think about the fact that there are 295 days left.
for the Lord to move on your behalf in whatever area you're believing for him to move forward in your life on. And so I don't want you to lose hope. I don't want you to get in a position where you, you think, oh my God, I don't know if it can be done because it's not happening right now. There's more than enough time for God to do what he needs to do. As a matter of fact, the more difficult the situation is, the more that you're going to see that God is going to come through and manifest on your behalf. And so the Bible is very clear. The Bible says, look, God says, look, I need you to know and understand that there's nothing that's too difficult for me. There's nothing that's too difficult for me. No matter how challenges, challenging the situation is, God wants you to know that there's nothing that's too difficult. Nothing that's too difficult. Somebody need to hear that this morning. Nothing is too difficult for him. Nothing in your life is too hard, too challenging, too, you know, there's not enough opposition in the world that could stand against what it is that God has for you. The Bible is so clear. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you would really internalize it, what you have on the inside of you, and I think Pastor Chloe did a great job last week talking about the power that works on the inside of you. But if you will really internalize it, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world, there's no thing, there's no person, there's no situation, there's no circumstance that will cause you to believe that you cannot move forward in him. The Bible is very clear. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We are going to have afflictions. There are going to be tough times. But God says he delivers them, us out of how many of them? Out of all of them. And all is, is inclusive of everything. It doesn't leave anything out. So we have to keep that at the forefront of our mind. And I know that there are uh, some of you in here, God has been doing great things. I believe all of you, God's been doing great things. Sir, amen? Amen. Well, I'm excited. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think, intimately or infinitely, beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. And some versions say, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think, according to the power that works on the inside of us. Like I said, Pastor Chloe did a great job last week talking about the power that works on the inside of you. And we've been talking for the last several weeks about that exceeding uh, thing that God wants to do in our lives, that overflow, that superabundance, that God doing, uh, God doing more than we could ever ask or think, but even more so God overperforming in our lives. And so we talked about different types of overflow. And I really want to talk about um, some more about the financial overflow uh, right now. I'm excited about setting our expectations for financial overflow. And again, here we are at the beginning of the year. We still have 295 days to get your credit score together. Right? You still have 295 days to get your credit score together. You still have 295 days for God to turn around your situation. If you've gone through a bankruptcy, you've gone through a situation where you owe the IRS money, you still have 295 days for God to do something supernatural. And so you can't look at not just the timing, you can't just look at what took place or what happened because God is a God that delivers us out of them all kind of God. So when we think about our finances, you know, we talk about giving, we talk about tithes and offerings, and I'm going to talk about tithes and offerings at some point, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm going to talk about uh, more specifically the mindset that we need to have so that we can have an overflow in the area of our finances, the mindset that we need to have so we can have an overflow in the area of our finances. We said in the past that financial overflow requires our obedience, our resourcefulness, and our fearlessness to produce increase. We said financial overflow requires our obedience, our resourcefulness, and our fearlessness to produce increase. I want to look at Matthew 25 and 29. Matthew 25 and 29. Now those of you who are probably wondering, why does she have on her college uh, um, card again? <laughs> well, uh, I have to tell you that um, I, it, to me it's a faith prop for today. It's a faith prop for today. Because even though I may have grown up in a middle class, so what, maybe a little above middle class family or household, there were some things that happened in my life, there were some things that happened in my family's life that affected our finances. 
affected our finances. And they affected our finances to the degree that all that my parents had saved up for, all that they had put aside for, for my sister and I to have a car when we got out of high school, for to pay for college and all those things. When what happened, when we were attacked financially, none of that was anything that we could count on anymore. We had to live off of our savings. And so I, unless I got a scholarship, I was not going to college. Unless I got a job, I wasn't going to college. It didn't matter that I have above a 4.0. None of that mattered. What mattered was I had to believe God. We had to trust God to do something supernatural. He had to overperform in my life in the area of college. He had to perform it over. No, I have to help you understand something. No, it was to the degree where my, my family had gotten in a situation where my father got in a business deal with a friend of his that we had known for a very, very long time. This wasn't a new person. We left where we lived, moved to a whole nother place, believing God, you know, uh, believing God that, hey, you know what? Here we are. We're in this new place. We're going to do uh, this new business and, and, and great things are going to come out of it. And then this other person was not a righteous person. That's why the Bible says, how can two walk together lest they agree? And the Bible says, look, you know, uh, you need to make sure that you don't join yourself with unbelievers in business. Right. Right. And so here, my dad, and, and he, he joined himself with a person who was really not a believer. Went to church, but he was not a believer. And so what ended up happening was that they had this business together and, and, and this business that they had formed together was a great business. It was, it was a very good business and it was growing and it was doing very well and they got, you know, a really beautiful office out where we lived and, and on the golf course and it was beautiful. Everything was going well. People were requesting their, their uh, services and everything. And then one day this, this partner got, got greedy. And his partner got so greedy that the money wasn't coming in from the contracts that they determined that, you know what, I need that money sooner, so I'm going to take the credit card that has, has my father's name on it, and I'm going to charge up a house full of furniture with his card. So he took my father's card, and it was a gold American Express, which back then was really, you know, hard to get. And my dad taught us that we didn't use credit for anything unless it was an emergency. We paid cash for everything. And so it was a big deal. So he stole the card. And when he stole the card, he stole it. He forged my father's signature on the card to buy what he bought. So little did we know that all this was going on because, uh, you know, we're just living our lives and everything looks like it's going great and shipments are coming in and we're doing the services that, that the company provides my dad and them. And then one day we get a knock on the door and the knock on the door is to come and arrest my father and take him to jail. And so we're wondering what in the world is going on? Why in the world are you coming to take my father to jail? What did my father do? Well, they said they didn't want to have any conversation with that. They just needed to take him to jail. So they handcuffed my, handcuffed my father, take him to jail. And we're wondering what is happening. He said it was for fraud. We said, fraud? What kind of fraud? What are you talking about? My dad doesn't do, my dad's a man of integrity. He wouldn't commit any kind of fraud. Well, we finally said, no, no, obviously there's some things here. There's your signature here. This is your signature that you signed for these things and you did not pay. And so my dad said he got to the jailhouse and he got there and he just began to pray. Now my dad had just given his life to the Lord at that time. He began to pray and he just began to seek the Lord. And not only did the Lord spare him from going in the jail cell, the, the command that the officer at the time just said, you know what, why don't you just sit at the desk next to me while we figure all this out. So they didn't book him, they didn't fingerprint him, they just had him sit at the desk next to him while they were trying to figure it out. Long story short and fast forward, what we found out was what I just shared with you was that they had forged my father's signature. Well, when things like that happen and your credit get, gets messed up, even though we eventually determined through many court proceedings, they had a, a handwriting expert determine that it was not my father's signature, it still damaged their credit for seven years. So now we had to deal with the credit being messed up for seven years and all he did was make a poor judgment to go into business with somebody who wasn't saved. So now we're paying for that by determining, hey, whoa, can we stay in this house we just built? What about food from week to week? My mom had not fully, uh, I think she had just gotten a job, but obviously he was the primary breadwinner. And so we're believing God to 
not lose our home. We're believing God to make sure we have enough money for groceries. We're believing God that it's my senior year. I need to go to college and I determine, well, you know what? I'm going no matter what. God's going to do something supernatural. He's got to do something supernatural. I didn't have over a 4.0 for me to sit at home and to, and to go work at a grocery store. Now, I did work at the grocery store, but that's not all that he wanted me to do. I know what he shared with me and I know what he told me. And so I got before God and I asked God to do something supernatural. And I can tell you that uh, God God not only showed up but he showed out he exceeded my expectations of all the schools that I applied to and I had no desire to apply to an HBCU but that God said you know what I want you to apply to this specific school he told me in my prayer time and I said what in the world is a prayer review I never even heard of a prayer review before never even heard a prayer review and I went and I looked it up and the Lord said I want you to apply to that school now all the other schools I applied to were out of state and this one was in state and the Lord said, no, I want you to apply to that school. Not only want you to apply to that school, I want you to go to that school. And I'm like, Lord, I got to go with whoever gives me the money. Because at this point, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have the money to do it. And I'm not seeing myself working. He didn't show me myself working and doing that. I already worked those four years in school. And so um, on my birthday, my senior year in high school, I received a letter from the university that I'd gotten the four-year presidential scholarship that it was fully paid, paid in full for four years, not just tuition, not just room and board, but I had dry cleaning. I didn't even dry clean my clothes for four years. I had dry cleaning, I had everything, and then I had so many scholarships that I got overpayments every year that I bought a new wardrobe every single year of clothing to wear. I literally could wear three months worth of clothes and never even wash them and not even miss it. And I said I ought to say as God says, look, I'll supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. My riches are not his riches. His riches are not my, my riches. And so uh, his wealth is, was totally not my wealth. And my wealth was not his wealth. So God says, let me help you understand something. Though it looks like, this is for somebody right now. Though it looks like there's no money on the way. Though it looks like there's nothing that, there's nothing that you can do to accomplish complete, the completion of paying that thing or paying that bill or meeting that need, you have to believe that God is who he says he is and that there's nothing that's too difficult for him and that he will manifest whatever he needs to manifest in order to make sure that your need is met. He will manifest whatever he needs to manifest. So in spite of my parents, credit that was messed up for seven years, that means all the way until I got married, their credit was messed up. I mean, almost from, my, from then all the way till I think Kai was, uh, Chloe was born, their credit was messed up. And it wasn't anything other than a decision that they made. So number one, number one, do not go into business with an unbeliever. Do not be unequally yoked in business with an unbeliever because you will pay the price. Now God will, God will manifest. And God, how many of y'all are going into business with somebody you know you don't need to go into business with? And they mess you up. It's one of those situations where you have to determine, hey, I'm going to do the word of God. I cannot be unequally yoked. I've got to move forward the way God says to move forward. And I saw that God did not only that, not only did he, did he manifest himself within this seven-year period, but I'm going to tell you something that even though that they didn't have the luxuries that they had before, they couldn't have every single need was met. I'm going to tell you, my grandmother at the time, she didn't even, um, didn't even know the, the dire state that we were in. But we never went without groceries. She would come every single week and make sure that we had groceries. Now you have to understand, we went from having whatever we wanted to having to rely on help for groceries. And so, I, you know, it reminds me of the scripture where Paul says, look, I've learned how to be content with and without. I've lived that. I know how to be content with and without. So when this bigger test came in 2017, I've done that. I know how to not know where the food's coming from. I know how to know, like, I've never even seen government cheese before, but I saw it, and I saw the peanut butter during those couple of years. And I, and I understand, and I know what needed to happen in order for me to go where God needed for me to go. The Bible says that we're not supposed to despise our small beginnings. And even though you may have been on your way and you weren't beginning at the moment, sometimes you have to begin in the midst of being on the path. You have to begin again in the midst of being on the path. And there's nothing wrong with beginning again in, when you're in the midst of being on the path. You can't despise that. 
if I despise, you know, the fact that, I mean, I couldn't ask my mother and father for anything for four years in college. I didn't want to put them in that position because they didn't have it to give to me. So I had to make sure that I used my, my overpayment money properly. I had to make sure that if I needed more than what my overpayment was and I needed for this or that, you know, I was an art minor and, and being an art minor in college, even an art major, is very expensive. I mean, all those paints and canvases and all that stuff that we had to buy, that's very, very expensive. And so I remember thinking, man, I'm going through all this money because I've got to buy all these, this equipment and all these different things, knowing that I couldn't ask my parents for a thing. Don't even think about asking for a thing. I got to tell you something that when it looks like it's dire, when it looks like there's no one that can help you because they're in a situation that may be worse than what you're in or they may be in a situation where they're struggling or they're having a challenge, you've got to know and understand that God says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And then we look at the word of God that says, look, I, you know, I've seen, he said, he, he said in the word of God, he says, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I was once young, now I'm old, but I've never ever seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. You don't ever have to be concerned about being in that situation if you do just a few things we're going to talk about today. Just a few things we're going to talk about today. Matthew 25 and 29 says, For everyone who has and values his blessings and gifts from God and has used them wisely, more will be given. And he will be richly supplied so that he will have an abundance. But the one who does not have because he has ignored or disregarded his blessings and gifts from God, even that, or even what he does have, will be taken away. He says, look, let me help you understand something. You've got to value and you've got to respect what I put on the inside of you. You've got to value, you've got to respect what I put on the inside of you. You've got to value, you've got to respect what I've given you. Even if what I've given you is just a small amount to work with. Even if it's just a small amount to work with. Give glory and honor to God for that small amount that you have to work with. Thank him for that small amount that you have to work with. I want to look at Philippians uh, 4. Philippians 4. I want to share uh, some principles that I want you to grasp and remember so that you can, I'm just going to hit these principles. So you're going to write these scriptures down. You can write, um, put maybe um, just a reminder next to the principle. But these are just some things where the Holy Spirit is going to teach you from his word that you can keep at the forefront of your mind as the enemy is trying to attack you in these different areas you can remind him of his word Philippians 4 now the, the tagline for that is God fulfills the need of those who support the ministry Amen. I just want to share that to you share that with you Stacy shared that earlier God fulfills the needs of those who have supported and support the ministry Philippians 4 I'm going to read verses 15 to 20 in the Amplified. It says, And you Philippians know that in the early days of preaching the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I do seek the profit which increases to your heavenly account, the blessing which is accumulating for you. So he says, look, you know what? I was out in the bound in ministry. I appreciate the fact that no one blessed me like you blessed me, like this church blessed me. And as a, <clears throat> as a result, my needs were met to do what I needed to do in ministry. And I said, I didn't, it's not like I'm looking for the money. He said, I'm not looking for the gift. He says, but I do seek the profit that increases. He said, that I, what's more important to me is the fact that you obey God. And as a result of you obeying God, God blesses you. So he says, I, I do seek the, the profit which increases to your heavenly account, the blessing which is accumulating for you. I think that's amazing. Accumu it's accumulating for you. Every time you sow into the ministry, the blessings of the Lord are accumulating for you. It says, but I have received everything in full and more. This is Paul. And I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me. They are the fragrant aroma of an offering, an acceptable sacrifice which God welcomes in which he delights. And my God will liberally supply, fill into full your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So God fulfills the needs of those who support ministry. Number one. Now, why did I say that and it sounds so simple? Because those that don't support ministry, that's why you're suffering a little bit. No, no, that's why you're suffering a little bit. Now, I don't go and look and see who's tithing and who's not tithing, but I do have a general idea of the percentage of, of tithers or the percentage of sowers in the house. And I can, there, I can say that there are those who are in the house and everyone, I mean, I just thank God and praise God that you all have been well taught by Bishop, amen, and I, well taught, amen. But there are those who for some reason are allowing the enemy to swindle you out. 
of your blessing because there's an accumulation taking place. There's a momentum effect taking place and accumulation as a result of the seed that's been sown into ministry. And you're stopping the momentum when you don't sow. Amen. You're stopping the momentum when you don't sow. And it says here, he says, he says, um, those of who have supported the ministry, we read the scripture, we say, you know, God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And we forget that it has to do with those who sow into the ministry. So we can quote that scripture all day long. God's going to supply my needs according to his riches and glory. He's going to supply, he's going to supply, he's going to supply. And then we go in a corner and we start crying because we're trying to wonder where the supply is. Where's the supply? I thought I was supposed to be supplied. I thought I had an accumulation. I thought God was doing exceeding abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. And he said, but you've been robbing me. You, you might as well have just stuck the gun right up in my face. You've been robbing me. Because you've determined, because the Bible says bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So that there may be meat in your house. We're going to read that. He said, I don't want you to bring a piece of it. Bring the whole tithe. You know what the whole tithe is. The whole tithe is the 10%. It was an awesome uh, word that Minister Nate gave this morning. God is not forcing you. It's not of, of, of obligation. It's not because God is compelling you in that way. He's saying, look, as a result and as an effect uh, of the worship and, and the relationship that we have, this is something that's simply uh, a connection between you and I, something that, you know, is not said and not shared and not talked about between one and another. It's you giving your tithe, your act of worship, releasing the covenant agreement that you have with your Father God. What does his wealth look like? I'm going to give you one scripture, Haggai 2 and 8. He says, I'm a, he says, because you got to remember, and my God will liberally supply, fulfill your every need according to his riches. Another verse says, according to his wealth and glory in Christ Jesus. So what's his wealth look like? Real simple, Haggai 2 8. God love God. He's so simple. It's not really that difficult, y'all. God is just so simple. It says this, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. He said, all the money in the world belongs to me. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. Now, you know, in general, our money used to be backed up by gold, right? And it used to be backed up by silver, right? And God's saying, I need you to know and understand, all the gold is mine. All the silver is mine. Why are we sitting like a little bitty, you know, mouse, you know, uh, with our little whiskers, you know, shivering and shaking, all afraid and nervous because we don't have this. And don't get me wrong, I've done it before too. We don't have the money to pay for that or we don't have the money to pay for this. When the Bible says the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I also know that he says in James that if you need wisdom, all you have to do is ask. So I want to know how to get that silver and gold. So I'm going to ask, Lord, how do I get what is necessary so that my needs are met? How do I position myself to be in that overflow state where you're doing super abundantly above all I could ever ask or think? So, remind yourself of this, Matthew 6. In the process, God knows your needs, so you have to refuse to worry. Now, I know that's, that's not always just that simple, but you have to put it at the forefront of your mind. You have to do it in advance. I refuse to worry. I refuse, somebody say, I refuse to worry. I refuse to worry. As soon as I start to find myself worrying, I, this is what I do, as soon as I start to find myself getting to a place of worry, I determine that I'm going to refocus on kingdom purpose. I'm going to refocus on kingdom purpose so that I can receive. I'm going to refocus on kingdom purpose so I can receive. Matthew 6, 31 through 34 in the Amplified says, Therefore, do not worry or be anxious, perpetually uneasy and distracted, saying, what are we going to eat and what are we going to drink and what are we going to wear? For the pagans, the Gentiles, eagerly seek all these things. But do not worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first and most importantly, seek him, aim at and strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and the attitude and the character of God, and all these things will be given to you also. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. He said, don't bring trouble to the next day because you worry. When you worry, you're carrying a whole other boatload of trouble to the next day. I need you to think about that. I need you to think of yourself as a receptacle. You're going to carry peace into the next day, and you're going to carry trouble and worry into the next day. I want to come into the next day believing God that his mercies are new every single morning. When I wake up in the morning, Lord God, your mercies are new every morning. I'm not going to forget the benefits that you have 
toward me. The benefits that I have is of being a believer in the kingdom of God. I'm not going to forget those benefits. So I'm going to refuse to worry. I'm going to refuse to worry. I'm going to refocus myself on kingdom purpose and receive. Third thing. <laughs> you need to remember that situations of financial difficult, difficulty can be temporary first by faith. When we were in the situation that we were in and we weren't able to have anything extra my senior year in high school and I didn't have a car that my parents were saving up for me to drive, I didn't have, there was no extra. I didn't even have a dress that was not handmade by my mother. Every formal I ever had, every dress that I ever had to go somewhere, my mother made my dresses. My sister's dresses, my dresses, my, or my godmother would make them. They always made our, our, our formal clothes. They made them. They were handmade. And I remember thinking about how, how the word of God that I just read before said, do not, do not take for granted the gifts that he's put on the inside of you. So while I couldn't go to the store maybe and buy that dress from wherever, I was able to get enough fabric and my mother was able to make the dress. See, we, we despise our small beginnings. So now that's like a big thing. Ooh, I had tailor-made clothes. Uh, when you're in high school, that doesn't seem like tailor-made clothes. When your mom made you a dress, that doesn't feel like tailor-made clothes. Right? Because your mom made your dress. Everybody else went and bought their stuff on the rack. But all my dresses were made by my mother or my godmother. Right? That's a great thing now. But that's why I'm saying don't despise that. Don't despise that. You know, some of you, you know, you didn't have the money to go get your nails done. You did your own nails. Right? I didn't get my nails done like out and pay for them until I was 35 years old. I did my own nails. I did my own beautification. I did all my own stuff. Not because I thought I was better than anyone else. Because I, I actually at that time, I was so used to being content with not having this or that. Then I learned how to, I learned some skills along the, uh oh, homework. I learned some skills along the way. Homework, homework, homework. Some of y'all, wow. Some of y'all are really gifted and talented in here, but you're used to paying some people to do some stuff that you can learn to do on your own. Oh, I hear some people calling out names. <laughs> so the homework assignment is, you need to rediscover a skill that you can do that you don't have to pay somebody for and do it. Somebody say, save some money. Save some money, that part. So y'all got the homework? I got the homework? Yes. Paying somebody to cut the grass when you can cut the grass. <laughs> right? Paying somebody to dust the blinds when you can dust the blinds. Amen. Somebody say, save some money. Save some money. All right. Situations of financial difficulty can be temporary by faith. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, from day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So we need to remember and understand that the situation we're going through is temporary. It's temporary. And I think we believe in God for things to get not only better, but for God to overperform in our lives. Amen. For God to overperform. So even though we've experienced financial hardships or bankruptcies or loan rejections, poor credit scores, unpaid tax bills that could be due to real situations like health issues or um, family situations or even a lack of good stewardship, we have to remember what the Word of God says in Psalm 34 and 17 and 18. It says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them and he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saved those who are crushed in spirit. He said, look, don't be all high and mighty. You messed up. You messed up. You made some mistakes. You did some things that were wrong. You used some poor judgment. Just repent. Just say, Lord, you know what? I'm sorry for what I did. You know what? I should have listened to you. I got this warning and that warning, and you gave me this dream and that dream, and somebody called me and told me about their character, but I wanted to find out for myself. I want to find out for myself. I need to know for myself. I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. So I wanted to find out for myself. And now you're under, right? So all you have to do is repent. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Not just I'm sorry, because repentance and apology are two different things. Apology says, I'm sorry. Repentance says, I'm turning away from what I used to do. I'm going to turn in another direction. I'm going to do something totally different. 
So yes, apologize to God, but then repent. Ask him to reorder your steps to show you what you need to do so you don't repeat that same thing again. Real simple. Lord, I don't want to repeat that again. I don't want, we're going to repent right now. Let's stand to our feet. We're not going to wait till later. We're not going to wait till later. Now, I know that there's something financially. We're dealing with finances. I know that there's some decision you made, some connection you made, some ill covenant relationship you had, some kind of meeting with people you didn't need to be meeting with, something that you did, some, somehow you relied on other things outside of God. Somewhere along the way, you made some poor financial decisions. Can anybody attest to that? We all can. We made some poor financial decisions. We did. And so now we just want to say, Lord, I repent. Lord, forgive me, but now I repent. I want to be in a position to hear your voice clearly and truly do Psalm 23, where, Lord, you are my shepherd, so I shall not want. Yeah, I want you, you know, when we, we want to read real quick, real, real quick to the cup overflowing. The cup doesn't overflow until the Lord has been our shepherd. There's no overflow until the Lord has been our shepherd and we've been doing what he said to do. So I believe that there are those of you, like I said, you may, it may have been bankruptcies, it may have been, um, you know, tax bills that are, uh, you know, years and years unpaid. It could be a situation where you just determined that you made some poor decisions uh, business-wise, but you need to repent before God. I want you to take that time on your own and just do that. Lord, I'm sorry. You do the, I'm sorry. Do the apology. After you do the apology, just say, Lord, I repent. I repent. I repent. I want to turn away from the patterns that have me going in the direction that I didn't need to go in, that, to make the alliances and the connections with people I should not have made alliances and connections with. You know, I believed in luck and chance, and I should have been believing by your spirit. I determined that I was going to sow my money into charity, but the Bible didn't talk about charity. The Bible talks about bringing the whole tithe, the full tithe into the, into the uh, storehouse. And though, Lord, I've given, my, I've given over and above, I've given an offering to those charities, that is not the tithe, that is not what is... Uh, uh, what is looked at to be a blessing, to be, to be received by the Lord. And so, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. And now, Lord, show me. Show me again the right way. And, Lord, I will attune my ear. I will incline my heart to make sure that I do exactly what you want me to do. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, Father I, now I now repent for any, for any poor decisions. Poor decisions that I have made concerning my finances. I ask you, Lord, to give me the wisdom and the insight and the opportunities all over again so that I can please you in this area of my life. Lord, I declare that my decisions will be led of you and that when I connect with people for business, that it will be your sons and daughters, not strangers. I believe that you are moving on my behalf to begin to make every crooked place straight. Lord, I'm asking that you bring deliverance now in the area of my finances. I'm asking, Lord, that you bring deliverance now in the area of my finances. I receive because I am a sower. I am a sower. And I thank you for every blessing associated with it. Lord, from this day forward, I will be responsible financially giving all honor and glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Why wait, right? Why wait when we can do it now? Amen. Why wait when we can do it now? So fulfillment of our need is uh, predicated on our seed. Fulfillment of our need is predicated on our seed. Malachi 3, 10 11. We said, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. My God, bring the tithe in so you can eat. No, I'm not making you tithe, God says, but if you bring the tithe in, you can eat. 
Now when I look at that word eat, that word eat is not just natural food, it's spiritual food. Some of us can't understand what God is talking about because we haven't been sowing into the kingdom. How are we going to sow into a kingdom to get some wisdom from the kingdom, from the king that rules the kingdom, when we have not sown and invested any seed? So he says, I need you to bring the full tithe into the storehouse. So there'll be meat and food in my house. Thereby, he said, put me to the test. If I, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, that sounds like overflow. And pour down a blessing that there is no room to receive or no more need. You know, I want to say that, uh, again, many of you in here, so many of you give your tithes, you give your offerings. But I want you to look at Philippians 4 and 12. I want you to be encouraged, those of you who do give your tithes and offerings and those of you who have not because you've allowed the enemy to put you in fear because of what you think you don't have. I want you to just be encouraged with the word. Philippians 12 and 13, it says, I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And it says, I can do all this or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Psalm 34, 9 and 10. Two more scriptures. I'm going to close with this. Psalm 34, 9 and 10. It says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. The God's Word version says, Fear the Lord, the holy people, you holy people who belong to him. Those who fear him are never in need. Never in need. So I want to leave you with a reminder that as your respect, your reverence, your esteem for God goes to another level, in hearing his voice, being obedient to his voice, God says that you will never, ever have a need. Not only will that need be met, but you will never have a need. It won't even come up. God will, God will supply to the degree that it won't even come up. And so we've got to believe his word, trust his word, and believe what he, what he says here. Psalm 37, 25, I've been young and now I'm old. And he said, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. This thing goes beyond you and into your bloodline, into your, your family. You can cut and break the cycle of lack if you make the decision yourself to determine that, you know what, I'm going to fear the Lord. I'm going to esteem him and reverence him. He's not going to be my last resort. He's going to be my only resort. I'm going to do that to the degree that I'm going to obey him. The Bible says, if you love me, he says, you'll keep my commandments. I'm going to obey him to the degree that I'm showing that I fear him, that I esteem him, that I reverence him. And the Bible says, in that I will have not even a need. Won't even have a need. Won't even have a need. So I ask you to go back. If you grew up and you had need in your family, go back. When you go home, I want you to go home and say, you know, I repent on behalf of my bloodline. I want this thing to be cut today. I repent on the on the behalf of my bloodline. I no longer want to see lack and struggle and suffering and the up and down and living from paycheck to paycheck. I believe that this will stop. And Lord God, I just break this now because I'm going to do right and it's going to shift from me forward. Amen. It's going to shift from me forward. Let's stand to our feet. It's going to shift from me forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you are sowing. Now you understand when you sow and you can sow into this word, this is not going to me. Y'all know we don't play those games. This is going into the kingdom, amen? This is going to the general funds, going to the kingdom. So if you desire to sow on your way out as we close out, you can feel free to do so. But I believe that God is going to do something supernatural. We don't have to feel something for God to do something. Amen. We don't have to feel something for God to do something, right? Because God is not, he's not a God that's caught all up in his feelings. We don't have to feel something for God to do something. God is, is like, I mean, it's a whirlwind going all around us, and we might not even see our clothing move. We got to trust and know that God is moving and he is doing. Amen on our behalf. Amen, Pastor Well. Amen. A couple thoughts while you're on your feet. Uh, one of my thoughts was, was Dr. C is teaching kingdom principles for providential provision. Kingdom principles for providential position, uh, provision. But then my thought kind of stretched out. It's kingdom principles for providential peace. Kingdom principles for the 12 areas of overflow. So, she, so she's saying, if, if these are areas where God wants you to overflow, then it's part of his providential will for you. But to step into that and activate that, she's teaching God's principles that trigger the release of God's 
promises into our lives. Does that make sense? Yes, you know, so I just, so I just want to make sure that we're taking this as, as the principles that we need to trigger the release of those promises. But it starts with getting into his presence. It starts with getting into his presence. It starts with having a personal relationship with God for yourself. So a couple of altar calls. One, if there's anybody here and you don't have a personal relationship with God, you've never prayed the prayer, you don't look at him as your father, and more importantly, you don't feel him looking at you as his child. I want to give you an opportunity to correct that. Second appeal is this. You've had a relationship with God. You received him as your Lord and Savior, but the pressures of life have pushed you to the point that you no longer feel his presence and his power actively moving in your life like you used to. And you're simply saying, God, you know what? I need more of you in my life right now. I need more of you in my life right now. Now, I don't know which one of those appeals that you're answering, but I will say this. If either one of those are you, I ask that you raise your hand right now. I don't know him as my Lord and Savior, but I don't feel the same level of connection. I don't have the same level of commitment, and therefore I don't see the same level of power moving in and through and on behalf of my life. So if either one of those are you, I ask that you raise your hand right now. Just giving you an opportunity to say, Lord, I need you as my Lord and Savior, or to say, Lord, I need you more active in my life, and I know that's the result of me making a decision that my commitment level to you is going up from this point forward. Are there any in your house? Are there any in this house? Third appeal is this. Simple appeal. If you're here and you're saying, you know what, I heard that word today, and I've been expecting a level of overflow in finances, but I didn't really realize God's overflowing in my life and finances is related to my obedience and my commitment to his house. And that triggers his response, being more active in my house. If you learn something today and you realize there's an adjustment that you need to make, I ask that you raise your hand right now. Wow, hands going up, hands going up, hands going up, hands going up, hands going up. And, 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 and since you recognize that, I'm going to make the assumption, and if I'm wrong, then you make the correction. I'm going to make the assumption since you recognize that when there was that opportunity for repentance, you repented for that, and you understand, and the change that you need to make is already formalized in your mind, in your heart, and we'll see the action coming from your hand moving forward. Amen? Amen. Now, let me, so pray this with me. Pray this with me. Say, Father, we thank you, Father, we thank you. for your darling son, Jesus, who came and died just for me. We thank you that his shed blood washes me and cleanses me from all shame, guilt, and error. We thank you that there's forgiveness. We thank you through forgiveness and repentance. We don't have to hold on to any mistake that we've made because you love us so much, you show us our mistakes so you can correct our mistakes so we can walk in our rightful place in right relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And come on, give God some praise for that.